So uh, our, our family, I don't know about your family, but our family enjoys watching uh, Star Wars and anything related to it. Uh, we know it's fun, it's fantasy, it's whatever, but uh, we also think it points to a lot of things that are reality in, uh, in our world and the world to come. And so we really enjoy the Star Wars films and all those various shows that are tied to the Star Wars universe, including um, the current uh, show that's out right now, uh, uh, Ahsoka Tana. Is that right? I don't know. Ahsoka Tana, that's what it is. Yeah, um, I have an aunt who looks like that, uh, kind of like the hair, you know, the things that are coming down. It's a joke, folks. It's a joke. Like, <laughs> some of you I know, you don't know. Just imagine any weird person on Star Wars. But um, I do not have an aunt who looks like that, just having fun. But when it comes to, uh, when it comes to Star Wars, this iconic film series that's been out for, you know, so long, uh, the early, uh, late 1970s, I think, 1977 it started, uh, there is uh, this really famous line that's repeated over and over again throughout the films and now in the shows, and it has to do with, it's like a greeting, like a positive greeting that's given, and um, it, it starts with the word, I'm just going to give you the first word, it starts with the word may, force be with you. Yeah, see, everybody knows it, most people know it. May the force be with you. The force is this kind of... Um, is this power that could be used for good or evil. And so, you know, may the force be with you is something that the good guys always say. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, uh, as I was, I was going through Star Wars and thinking about this, I came across uh, this other line that's repeated over and over again in the Star Wars films and now these shows they have that you've probably picked up on, like, intuitively, over the course of all the years, but you've not thought about it as deeply as may the force be with you. And it goes something like this. I've got a bad feeling about this. Now, I was blown away when I Googled this and found a montage of all the times that I've got a bad feeling about this is repeated in these movies. It's both sides, good and evil, who use this phrase Whenever, you know, something troubling's coming their way. And uh, it's, it's, it's used so often, I think you'll never watch Star Wars the same again, all right? So your pastor just did something very wonderful in your life. I've got a bad feeling about this. You're going to be like, oh my goodness, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, I'm not really sure what it is about repetition, but repetition can be a really positive thing in life. And uh, I know that uh, it can be really winsome and make life more enjoyable, one of, one of the things that we found is with our kids is that uh, I get a ride with my kids in the morning. The most of the time I spent, my kids spend in their truck, dad's truck, is uh, on the way to school in the mornings. So Alicia and I, we switch off days and take turns taking them to school. And she could take them every day because mom works there. But uh, I like to spend that time with them. So we, we kind of rotate who takes them when. And as we do, uh, the kids love to hear certain songs over and over again, right? The same, like, five songs. And so it's like, okay, well, let's do that. We'll have fun with it. Um, one of the songs that our kids are really into right now is a, it's a, it's got a little, bit, little bit older song. Not old, but a little bit older by a band called U2. And it's, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Anybody know that one? The question is, do you know what that song's about? You should research it. It's a good song. Um, and then uh, there's other songs that we like to listen to. There's this band called Switchfoot, uh, kind of a modern Christian band. And they have some songs, one called Native Tongue. And it's kind of referring back to if we could just speak to each other like uh, back before the fall, you know, like talk to each other that way. And, and they have another song called Voices. And Archer loves voices. Every time he's in the car, he wants to hear voices. And in fact, I can't get the voices of these songs out of my heads because we listen to them. Every day, most every day, we will listen to them when we go home today. Uh, they will ride with Dad, and we'll listen to those songs. But, uh, you know, can we hear it again, Dad? Sure. One more time, one more time, one more time. So we put it on repeat, and we do it again. You know, the, the scriptures are uh, very much into this repetition thing, of the same thing being said over and over again. Uh, I would even go further and say God himself is very much into the repetition thing. And one of the things that we're going to find in scriptures that we're going to focus on today is that God puts his promises on repeat. So there's a lot of repetition in the Bible. 
One of the ways that the Bible repeats things is God's promises to us, like what he says he wants to accomplish in our lives. And the reason why the promises of God are repeated over and over again in the Bible is because it's God himself who's repeating that promise to humanity over and over again. In fact, uh, one of the most uh, commonly repeated phrases in the Bible, you might have heard this before, is uh, some variation of, do not fear, or don't be afraid. Uh, 300 plus times, I think, is what the accounts are of how many times it's in the Bible, which means about five times for every book of the Bible, every four chapters or so in the Bible, you hear this repeated phrase, this repeated promise and comforting words from God of, do not be afraid, don't fear. And the reason why is God says, because it's I'm up to something, right? I've got your back. I'm taking care of things or whatever. And so there's this often repeated phrase uh, that God says, which kind of says something about who we are as humans, that we need to hear that phrase over and over again. Kind of says that there must be this human tendency to easily get afraid and, and therefore respond to that fear. And start acting in accordance to that fear. And so God has to say again and again, he's got to give this these encouraging and comforting and even spine-stiffening words. Do not fear. And we're like, okay, okay. I heard it from the Lord. You know, I had that happen this week as I was with the Lord in prayer. and, And went to the word and just jumped off the page at me, you know. And it's just like, okay, thank you, God. And it's something about that just puts confidence in you again. So God says, hey, don't, don't yield to the fears that are attempting to hijack your mind, your heart, your life, your marriage, your family, our church, our mission, the, the community around us, all that stuff. God says, don't, don't fear, right? So this, God has a habit of repeating and renewing his promises to us and his messages to us over and over again. So today I really believe the Father would have us focus on this this very truth from his word that he puts, uh, let's go back to that last one, he puts his promises on repeat. Comes every so often, comes back around. Can we hear it again, Dad? Father says, yeah, let me tell you one more time. Just to remind you. So, you know, one of the most encor- encouraging uh, themes that runs throughout the entire Bible is this idea that God will continually remind us of his promises and encourage us of what, what he wants to do. He, he, here's even what's even further encouraging is that even as we see in scriptures, when humans blow it big time, uh, they are almost always going to have to have some significant consequences to deal with, right? Hard stuff. Because they, they failed to trust God and they sinned and they did whatever wrong. And so the scriptures are honest about the hard consequences of sin that we have to deal with. And yet even when humans blow it big time, God comes back around and he repeats his promise again. It's kind of like, I know you changed. I know you, right, didn't act faithfully or consistently. But God says, I'm going to. I'm still going to be me. And I'm still going to love you. And I'm still going to keep my word to you. And I'm still going to keep my promise to you. And he comes back around and he puts his promises on repeat. Fear not. I've got you. So uh, we are nearing the close of the book of Numbers. And we're going to be, um, we're going to see as we do today that, uh, I love this phrase, that the God that Jesus calls Father, helps put things in perspective, the God that Jesus calls Father a.k.a. Yahweh in the Old Testament, we're going to see him once again remain consistent and repeat his willingness to fulfill a promise that he had given to Israel. Um, We're going to see Yahweh repeat and renew his promise to Israel, uh, to his people, of a land that he wants to give them, a land for his people. So God says, hey, I got this land for you, right? And I want to give it to you. And... First time around didn't go so good. But God comes back around a second time, and he says, okay, let's try this again. 
That's his promise to Pre, I've got a land for you. So uh, if you're newer around here, uh, welcome, uh, whether here in person or, or watching online. We're glad you're, you're with us. We are on our way through the Bible, front to back, cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. And we are nearing the end of the fourth book of the Bible, the book of Numbers. And as we've been going through the book of Numbers, we've come to this final section in Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 22 through 36, where the people of God are... Um, they're now in the plains of Moab, and this is the place where they basically had to hang out for 40 years because they, they failed to trust God the first time around when he said, I have a land for you. Uh, and not just, I have a land for you, but whenever God gives something to anybody who's willing to partner with them, with him, he gives it to them for the purpose of not just for their sake, but for the sake of others as well. So I want to give you a land, Israel, to bless you, to be my people. But I want to give you that land so that you might become a light to all the nations. And we might see, right, all the nations come to know the one true God, put their faith in him, their trust in him. So he places them geographically at the hub of the human masses at that time in the world. Right smack dab in the middle of the human masses, he, puts, he says, I'm going to put you there in Israel. In that place, so you can be a light to the nations, right? So God gives them this great promise, and He says, uh, "I'm going to do this, and I'm going to choose this people, Israel, not in, not because they're so great or so mighty or so wealthy or so smart or any of that. In fact, later on He says, because of none of that, you're the opposite of those things, which was not very flattering. <laughs> but he says, "You weren't you weren't so great, but I'm going to choose you." And I'm going to make you my people. And I put you in this place so that you can be blessed and so that you can bless the whole world uh, by sharing who I am. But what happened the first time around, right? God says, I'm going to give you the land. And they go in, they spy it out. And a couple of them say, yep, God's got it for us. We're going to take us. And then 10 of them say, nope, can't do it. No way. And they fail to trust God. And uh, the best way I like to say it is they got scurred. That's Modern slang for scared. <laughs> Getting everybody up to speed here, even though that's been around for a while now. Um, they got scared, and they blew it big time. So what happened? That's this commonly repeated promise of God, do not be afraid. Do not fear. Why? Because we are very easily swayed by fear. And that's exactly what happened to the people of God so they blew it big time. However, we serve a God who is consistent. He is faithful. He doesn't change. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what does he do? He puts his promise on repeat. And he says, just like last time, uh, let's try this again. So the very first time uh, when God said he wanted to give the people this land... He took a census of the people. And he says, okay, I want to get, take a census. I want, to get a, I want to get a count of all the men who are of fighting age. And basically he's forming an army because they're going to go in and take the land. Um, and this second time where he says, now we're towards the end of the book of Numbers. The 40 years is waning. It's almost over. And now it's time for God to put his promise on repeat. And they're going to, he's going to give them another shot. He says, okay, take a new census of the men of fighting age. Let's get this army formed. Let's try it again. Okay, so let's check this out. Numbers chapter 26. Uh, we find out that not one person on the list, on this new census of men of fighting age, had been among those listed in the previous registration taken by Moses and Aaron in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, they will all die in the wilderness. Not one of them survived except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. So God says, hey, take a census of the men of fighting age. Uh, however, when he tells them this, he reminds them of what happened last time. Right? He's trying to draw to mind. It's been 40 years now. It's been a while. And maybe they've kind of lost track of how that whole thing played out. And so the last census was 40 years ago, and he reminds them, hey, none of the people in that, that old census are 
the, the, they're going to be able to go in. Most of them have died off now. There may be a few remaining that are going to die really soon. And he's like, they, they can't go in. The, the only exceptions are Caleb and Joshua. Do you remember why Caleb and Joshua are allowed to go in? They trusted God the first time, right? For the first census. And when he said, this is what we're going to do, he, they said, okay, we believe you. We trust you. We're not going to trust what we see with our eyes or, right, the numbers of them against us. We're going to trust you. And remember when I made fun of Colorado and Alabama? Did Colorado get a nice win yesterday? Isn't that great for Colorado football? Anybody know that? Colorado won a nice game yesterday. Good job, Buffs, Buffaloes. Prime times doing his thing at Colorado. But, but yeah, that was it, right? There was all the fear that, hey, Alabama versus Colorado, whatever. Like, we don't match up against them, that whole thing. And, uh, and, and yet Caleb and Joshua believed God the first time. So God keeps his promise to these two men. And he says, you guys get to go in because you believed me the first time around. And he also keeps his promise just, just to this people in general, that he's going to give them a land. So a couple of things stood out to me as I was as working through this passage and I was reading through this particular portion of it. Um, first of all, this wake-up call that God gives them, he says that there's a generation who didn't trust me, they didn't believe me, they didn't take me at my word. So, so just, just beware of that. Take heed, right? Be careful. Don't follow the same path that they did, but rather you, you guys take a different path this time, right? Trust me, believe me, have confidence in me. Um, second, he keeps his promise to the two guys. And I think that's pretty cool. God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Even when it doesn't work out like we hoped, he's going to do it. You know, um, I think, I think, like I said, what does it have to do with our life, right? Well, a couple things that stand out to me. One is, sometimes when we fail, I, we think that God is done with us because we blew it. Right? Like, I, I tried, uh, I, I was going to trust God, and he called me to do something in my life. You know, and I've, I don't know about this. This is a unique thing because it's a pastor thing. But I've met a lot of uh, people down through the ages, uh, down through the ages, down through my ages, my life, sorry. <laughs> what am I talking about? Down, down through my life. Uh, mostly men who, because I'm a pastor, they've talked to me about their calling into ministry and that they ran from it. And it's just this unique thing because I'm a pastor and whatever and, right, like, um, and every one of them thinks that, like, they blew it. They blew their chance because they didn't do it when God said back then or whatever, which they did blow it at that time. You know, they did miss it. And yet, I've seen a number of them who, some of them late in life, like retirement age and whatever, who pick up the calling at that stage. And they say, you know what? I didn't do it when he called me back then, but I'm going to do it now, right? I, can, I, can't, I can't change the past, but I'm going to do what he's calling me to do now. And I think it's a beautiful thing. And I think it's often one of these things that we, we, we get this idea that because we failed God at some point that, you know, he doesn't want anything to do with us or that we missed our shot or whatever it might be, but... But God is a God who puts his promises on repeat, you know, and it says the, the scriptures that say, hey, the calling of God is irrevocable. Like he calls you in something he still wants you to do that and he's still calling you to do that even though you might have missed your chance or blew it or whatever. He says, I'm, I'm going to put my promise on repeat and I'm going to ask you, okay, let's try this again. Let, let's do it now, right? I, wanna, I wanna still want to use your life. I still want to work in you and do great things in you. And, and so this is what he says to the people of God. You know, put your faith in me. Believe me this time. Don't believe your fears. Don't believe what your eyes can see. Don't believe the, the common sense that your fears are shouting to you, right? We talked about this before, that we've been so trained by this world that we're convinced that what it's telling us is true because it's just common sense, you know. That's just the way it is. But God says, hey, sometimes my ways don't make sense according to this world. But I promise you I'll do it. And so he... He puts these promises on repeat, and it's a, it's a very awesome thing. You know, the second thing that I, I kind of see in this passage is um, that in, in some things, like, right, what does this have to do with me? What does it have to do with us? In some things, it takes us doing things together. 
things that God wants to do. Some things you can't do on your own as a believer, as a follower of Jesus. Sometimes he says, I want you all, us, to go together to accomplish something. I mean, you look at the life of um, Caleb and Joshua. The first time around, 40 years ago, these two guys were like, right, let's do it. God's going to do it. Let's do it. But those two men alone were incapable of doing it. They couldn't do it themselves, right? They couldn't. I mean, correct? It had to take everybody to say, okay, let's trust God. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Let's all go in together. And so these two men are like, they're all about God's plan and what he's going to do, and yet they can't do it on their own. It takes everybody to come together, and it doesn't happen at this first time around, but it does happen later. It does happen later, and it's an awesome thing to see. You know, as a pastor, I think part of our calling, my calling, is to, to be a mouthpiece for the Father in what he's, uh, what he's saying to the church at different times in our history. Uh, there's, there's a biblical New Testament language for that. It's called uh, uh, prophetic or whatever. Or, uh, and it doesn't mean like probably what you think it means. It means like proclaiming the word of God, proclaiming what God is saying to us right now. That part of the calling of a pastor is to say, where are we at as a church, and what is God doing, and where is he leading us, and all these kind of things. And uh, as a pastor, uh, I believe that God would have us know in our, our current season as a church, there's a real temptation for us right now to be ruled by fear instead of faith. And I mean that across the board, regarding all areas. And the reason why is this. We're not too different from the Israelites right now who left Egypt and have yet to make it to the promised land. What do you mean by that? Well, we're not the church that we used to be, right? Some of you have been here a long time. <laughs> Bill laughs. <laughs> but some of you have been here a long time. And you know this is not the church it used to be. And yet... There's a lot of us here in leadership and the church who also know we're, we're not yet the church that we believe God's calling us to be either. We're in this, we're, we're on the way, we're in this place in between who we've been and, and who God's calling us to be at this unique season in our history. And there's, there's a real temptation to give in to fear during this season, right? Fear what? Fear of what? Well, fear that we're never going to make it there. We're never going to make it to the promised land. Fear that we won't all stay together. We won't all, you know, Caleb and Joshua, and get on board together and go forward together. Fear that we won't figure it out, like how to, how to effectively win new people to Jesus. Because just so everybody knows, online, in person, whoever you talk to, like we're pretty serious about the Jesus thing around here. We think this is who we're supposed to be. Right? When unapologetically, we want to see as many people as possible come to Jesus and put their faith in him. And yet, we're in this kind of little bit of a wilderness season, aren't we? Where we're, we're wandering through and we're, we're, we're heading to the promised land, but we're not there yet. But I believe that God, rather than us you know, all dying off in the wilderness, I think God has a plan for this church. And I think he's got a beautiful path forward. In a bright path forward, and as your pastor, I want to encourage you, maybe even challenge you to, to take your eyes off of the fears or off of the frustrations or off of the whatever, and lock arms like Caleb and Joshua, and get the rest, get everybody together and say, let's go this forward together. Let's write, let's, let's dream, let's vision, let's have faith, let's trust God, let's unify as the body of Christ, because we are a puzzle that every piece matters. And God wants us to go forward together and see him great, do great things together. So God calls uh, the Israelites to, he says, I want you to form a census of the military age men. And he talks with Moses and he reminds Moses of the, the hard consequences in Moses' life. Where he says, Moses, I want you to know 
you're not going to be able to go in to the promised land, right? He's already told them this previously. And yet he renews this wonderful promise to Moses, and he says, Moses, but, but the people of God, they're going to go in, and they're going to take the land, and I got great things for them. And so Yahweh, he kind of puts his promise on repeat. Numbers chapter 27, one day the Lord said to Moses, hey, Moses, climb one of the mountains east of the river, the Jordan, Jordan River, and look out over the land I have given the people of Israel. So this particular land, uh, we'll, we won't see it now, but in just a minute we'll see this picture. And it literally is this like uh, scenic view of the promised land. And he says, Moses, go up there, take a look at it. After you have seen it, this land that I'm going to give the people, you, Moses, will die. Like your brother Aaron. For you both rebelled against my instructions in the wilderness of Zin. Um, I have a picture of, I took while I was in Israel. This is from uh, Jer- the area of Jericho. And up here is the, the mountain, the, they call it a mountain. They call these things mountains over there. But uh, it's, a, it's a big hill. Uh, this is the mountain. The, the cell phone towers were not there in Moses' day, by the way. But um, that's Mount Nebo. This is the mountain that God told Moses to go up on. And so take a look at the promised land. Check it out, Moses. Go look at it. Here's another picture. This is my picture. This is, I stole this one online, but um, didn't really steal it. Actually did pay for this one in particular, but usually I don't pay for them, but this is a good shot. <laughs> well, if you don't have to pay for it, right? But I did pay for this one. Um, need to make a, put that on the wall somewhere. This is the promised land from Mount Nebo at, during a very uh, green time in the season, right? Uh, when you're in the desert, that looks really good. <laughs> uh, now, you know, compare that to some other parts of the world, and it's not quite as green. But when you're in the desert and you see that, oh, my goodness. And they've been wandering in the desert, you know, and their, their consequence for their sin and And God says, Moses, go up on Mount Nebo, take a look. This is the land that I'm going to give their people. However, you you won't be able to go in. And and this is part of, I always always thought Moses was a really impressive person, character in the Bible, person in the Bible, uh, because of all the things that he did. And yet, I think this is one of the most impressive things about Moses, is God tells Moses, Moses, you're not going to be able to go into this land. And do you know that the, the whole next book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, that in just a couple of weeks we're going to dive into, the whole book of the Bible is Moses preparing the people of God to go into the land, right? He knows he's not going in, and yet he prepares them. And, and part of this whole process is he's preparing another leader, Joshua, to, to go take them in and, and to go into this land. And he knows he's not going to inherit it. But he prepares them and he follows God's call. And Moses has this like sacrificial mindset where he, he's laying down his life for this next generation, this new generation, this new census, right? They're going to go in and take the land. And he lays down his life so that they can inherit all these good promises of God. And, you know, I couldn't help as I was reading through this of just drawing as, as your pastor and saying, you know, what's the pulse of the church? Where is God taking us? What are we doing? I couldn't help but, but think in my heart and my mind that, you know, there's this, this call that we have as a church to equip our rising generations, the kids, the youth, the young adults, and to, to pour in these new generations that are coming up. And we say, the way we say it is those who are 30 and up, we want to pour into those who are 29 and younger intentionally pouring into them, preparing them for all that God has for them. And uh, even though Moses wouldn't see these promises of God take uh, root and happen in his lifetime, he still did it. He still prepped them. He still got them ready. And this is so true of so many in the Bible, like Abraham, right? The only plot of land God told Abraham, hey, remember the one part part in Genesis where God says, look around, Abraham, every direction you look, this land is going to be yours, it's going to be your family's. The only plot of land that guy ever had was his burial ground. Because God said, I'm going to accomplish it later in history, but Abraham, you have a part to play. And it's going to play out past your life. Abraham, that was the case. Uh, The New Testament church, they expected Jesus to come back in their lifetime, right? They're waiting for him, this expectation. Uh, He did not come back in their lifetime, in case you weren't sure about that. He didn't come back yet. 
Not only that, but so many others. Hebrews chapter 11, read, he, read Hebrews chapter 11, all these heroes of the faith, right? And God did great things in their life, and yet there was promises that he gave them that went beyond their life. And he said, I'm going to do great things through your faith in this lifetime, through your trust, through your confidence, through your dependence on me, through your whatever. It was almost as if God was saying to these, hey, you know, I, know, you know, like the, I think the older we get, the more we like trees. Is that true? Like, I don't know. It is for me. <laughs> but the older I get, the more I like trees, you know, because you, you're with them for a while, right? You watch them grow. We planted trees in our backyard when we first moved in four years ago, and now they're so much more than they were then, and now we think, hey, you know, down the road. But it's almost like being willing to plant seeds for a tree or plant a sapling, and you know I might not be around to see this to its full maturity. But I want my kids to see it and enjoy it, right? I want my grandkids or I want, you know, the future generations of people to, to be able to enjoy these kind of things. And I really believe that in large part that's where we are as a church. And I know if you're older than me, you're probably hearing me talk to the old people. Well, I'm talking to anybody who's 30 years and older, which includes me. I think our calling as a church is to sacrificially lay our lives down for our kids and our youth and our young adults and to intentionally pour into them, right, to say, what do they need to come to Jesus? What is it that they need to, to, to grow in faith in him? What is it that they are in need of that we would say, I'm going to be a Moses, right? I know I'm not going to enter into that promised land. I'm not going to see it all and experience it all, but I'm going to lay down my life so that they can. And why? So that these generations can be what? A light to the world around them, right? That more people would come to faith in Jesus because we sacrificially poured into them and loved them and gave our lives for them. You see, our mission as a church is to engage everybody, all the pieces to the puzzle, to equip rising generations to live for Jesus. I think every one of us has to sit down and ask ourselves, like, because this is what we're doing, right? This is where we're going as a church. Like, am, am I a part of that? And maybe you say, I, I want to be, but I have no clue, like, how to, how to do that. And that's a great place to start. And as leaders, we're starting to have those conversations more intentionally of how do we equip the people. We've got to ask yourself, am I a part of that? Do I really want to be a part of that? Do I want to equip them? Do I want to pour into them? Do I want to sacrificially lay down my life for them? You know, I, I think there's a, this great example that we find in the scriptures about this kind of approach to the Christian faith. But you probably don't talk about it enough. And the greatest example of God keeping his promise, this promise he puts on repeat through the old, old testament that someday he's going to send somebody, right? And it finally happens, Jesus comes. The greatest display of God keeping his promises is when he sent Jesus, his son, for all of humanity to save us from our sins, any and all who would embrace him. And when Jesus came, he did that for, right, to remove our sins from us, that we might come back into relationship with the Father. But he did it even further as a, a pattern or an example for us to follow. Let me say that again. Jesus' life and his death is a pattern for us to follow. What's the pattern? He laid down his life for us. Therefore... We should lay down our lives for others, including one another. I, I know that a lot of us, uh, kind of like we know, may the force be with you, a lot of us probably really know well John 3.16, right? But there's another John 3.16, 1 John 3.16, that I think would, we would do well to know uh, in, in equal measure. It gives us a definition of what it means to love one another and, and how to walk that out. First John chapter 3, John says, you know, we know love by this. Or in other words, this is what love looks like. This is, love isn't just a, an emotion. Love is action, right? God love, God's kind of love is a, an action kind of love. And he says, we want to know 
love by this. We know what love looks like by this example, that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. So we ought to lay down our lives for each other like Jesus laid down his life for all humanity. Our kids, our youth, our young adults, I don't know if you ever think about them that way, but they actually are our brothers and sisters. They're just our little brothers and little sisters. Our younger brothers and younger sisters. What would it look like for you, me, to obey God's command here and lay down your life for our kids, for our youth, for our young adults? Now, uh, I know you may be thinking, what about me? But what about me? What about me? You know, I, I think about that in a, in a marriage. So those of you married, been married. Um, the way that a marriage works well is if I would like for Alicia to treat me a certain way, Probably the most likely way for that to come about is for me to treat her that way. In other words, if I want her to be considerate of me, I probably should be considerate of her. Um, Okay, now I'm convicting myself here, so maybe I should just stop where I'm at. If If I want Alicia to be considerate of me, I need to be considerate of her. Ask yourself that. I think this is a true principle in marriage, in any relationship, really. What's more likely to bring about a desired, positive, godly response from somebody? To sit back and demand that they do it, or to show by example that person? You take the first step. You know, in marriage, if ever, you, like, let's say, like, I'm not being considered of Alicia, da, 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 da. Um, she's not being considered of me. The calling for a husband or a wife is to say, okay, regardless of whether she ever does it or not, <laughs> I've got to do the right thing, and I've got to be considered of her, right? I've got to take the initiative. I've got to do the right thing and love her. I can't do it. Uh, you know, only, this, only if she loves me back, I'm going to love her. No, I have to love her unconditionally and show that love to her kindly and whatever. And whenever a person does that, I mean, this is like marriage counseling 101. Like, this is the way that marriages get resolved. If they're going to get resolved a lot of times, sometimes they don't, right? It doesn't always work out. But if it gets resolved, it's like you take the initiative Regardless of what they're doing, and you love them, you care for them, you do the right thing, you whatever. And over time, they might see that and reciprocate that love and say, you know what, I should be doing that. I need to take the initiative. I need to do it, whether he's doing it or not. And it's very similar when it comes to our kids, youth, and young adults. I think that we need to take the initiative and show them. If we ever want to see our kids and youth and young adults lay down their lives, because we know they're selfish little creatures, especially the small ones, right? Uh, that's That's just how we all are at that age. If we ever want to see them lay down their lives... For others, what's the best chance that's going to happen? If we do it first, if we show them, we lay down our lives for them and love them and care for them. We know how quick this life goes. It won't be long for those little ones, the teens, the young adults, before they're the elder group in the church. Right? And they're going to have to be laying down their lives for others. It won't be long. The best chance of that happening? Moses. Follow Moses. Lay down his life, even though he did. What are we talking about today? We're talking about how God puts his promises on repeat. Even when we fail, he brings his promises back around. And I really believe that this life in our church, that God is bringing promises back around, that he wants to accomplish great things in this people and through this people. But what's it going to take? It's going to take more than Joshua and Caleb. It's going to take everybody unifying together and saying, okay, let's actually do this thing. Right? 
let's pour into our kids. Let's pour into our youth. Let's pour into our love adult, young adults. So let's, let's show them what it looks like to lay down their life. And at some point in their hearts and minds, they're going to start thinking, boy, they, these people have sacrificed a lot for me. Maybe I should do that for somebody else. Maybe I should lay down my life like they lay down their lives for me. Hmm. Well, here we are. What about some action steps? What is God saying to you today? Number one, here's something that came up. These are things that came up in my heart and mind as I was preparing the message. Number one, walk in faith instead of fear. We are at a season in our life or a church where I think it's just easy to fear. It's easy to give in to the, all the what ifs and all the what a, what's going to happen and all this kind of stuff. We're not who we used to be. We're not yet where God is taking us. Walk in faith instead of fear. That's our path forward. It's the only path forward, right? It's the only path forward. Number two, let's walk in faith together, right? Let's unite in our common mission and vision from God that we would pour into the rising generations, that we would lay down our lives for them, that we would show them what it looks like to follow Jesus. And how do you do that? Show them what it looks like to follow Jesus. You lay down your life for them. That's how you do it. You show them precisely. As Christ laid down his life for us, we lay down our life for them. And so that is number three. That is the action step. Choose to lay down your life for our kids, youth, and young adults. We're going to walk in faith. We're going to unite and walk in faith together. And we're going to do that by laying down our lives for our kids, our youth, and our young adults. Because God has promises. He has a promised land that he wants to take this people to. Wonderful things that he has for us. And yet he says, you've got to do it together. You got to do it together, and you got to block out the fears and walk in faith. God has good plans, and we're excited to be a part of it. Amen? Hey, let's stand together, and let's pray together as a way of responding to the Lord. Father, we're so very grateful for all that you're up to, all that you're doing. Father, we're grateful that you put your promises on repeat. You don't make a promise and then walk away from it. You don't make a promise and say, well, you failed, so too bad. Yet you come back around and you say, okay, let's try again. Father, we're so grateful for that in our everyday personal lives that we can walk with you and know you and see you accomplish tremendous things in us and through us individually, Lord. But, Lord, as we've been focused on today and as we believe you've drawn the focus of the word today to this idea of the necessity of working together, unifying, that it won't happen unless we all say yes, unless we all unite Lest we all decide to lay down our lives for one another. No exceptions. Pastor has to lay down his life for people in the church. Elders have to lay down their lives for one another and people in the church. The members of the body have to lay down their lives for one another. And extending beyond us, Lord to the community around us who's far from you, doesn't know you. We would lay down our lives for them. Specifically, we think about our kids and youth and young adults, Lord. This unique calling you've given us to pour into them and show them the way. Lord, we ask for grace, for clarity, for unity of the Spirit, for vision, Lord, for your plans going forward, for a vision beyond our lifetimes, Lord, even, of what you're going to do. Father, we ask these things in the name of Jesus, and we call upon you for grace to obey whatever you're calling us to. Amen. Amen.